The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to RBH's first webinar of the season. Uh, we're glad you're able to attend. My name is Russ Walker, and I'm the Senior Vice President here at Reliant Behavioral Health. And we've got 12 of these uh, webinars upcoming this year. And so we hope you'll be able to attend more than one and tell your friends about them and colleagues, and we'll be happy to have them here with us. Um, our first uh, webinar today is one of our most requested webinars, so Sexual Harassment in the Workplace. And we're very lucky to have Karen Merrill here with us. Karen's a licensed clinical social worker, and uh, she actually used to work for RBH and has plenty of EAP experience, worked for several EAPs over the years, and also in the HR uh, industry. So she has a great um, level of experience, and I think we're going to get some, some good information from her. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and turn this over to Karen. Thank you, Russ. So I'm delighted to be here to present the first in this series. And uh, since it is the first, just a little bit about how this works. So you're going to be seeing uh, the screen, and then you're also going to have the option in the little bar to the right, if you have questions as we go, to um, fill in. There's a little chat box. And if you have a question, you can go ahead and put your question in there, and what we'll likely do is respond to those questions either at the end of this seminar as we have time or shortly thereafter. Um, just so you know also that there are three times in this presentation where we're going to be asking for your response, and my colleague Brenda Allen, who's also in the room, will be um, tallying your responses, and it will make this uh, more interactive, even though uh, it's in a webinar format, and you can't see me, and I can't see you. So with that, um, we're going to get started. So why are you here today? Um, you're here to be able to get a greater understanding of harassment and discrimination to examine your roles uh, as an employee or a supervisor, and also to remind you what your options may be if you perceive that you were a victim of sexual harassment. Now, sexual harassment isn't a new training topic. We've been training on sexual harassment for a number of years, but the fact that over 50 of you felt like it was worth your time tells us that this is still a topic of, of interest, and my hope is that what we'll do today is shed a little new light on this topic uh, in our workplace today. So here comes our first question. So how many of you that are joining today are mad? managers or supervisors, and how many of you um, do not manage others. And this is going to be uh, interesting because, as I had said previously, we're looking both at kind of your role as an employee and your role as a supervisor because there are, as you can expect, some additional um, requirements and expectations as a supervisor. So are all the votes in? No, the votes are still coming in. And um, so far, what we have, 57. Now 55% <laughs> of you are supervisors and 45 do not manage others. So I'm going to. So 91% of you voted. Some of you um, didn't. But it's just a little bit, well, here we go. We're getting some more votes in now. OK, let's, um, just give it another couple of seconds. OK, so we've closed the polling. 
And interestingly enough, we're just at about 50-50, 52% of you manage others and 48 do not. So good. So this is just gives us uh, a little bit more frame of reference for the material today. So again, why are we here? Well, on the face of it, every employee has the right to come into their workplace every day and feel free of sexual harassment or discrimination in any form. And then point of fact, it really is up to managers and supervisors to make that a safe workplace. It sounds simple, but the word really isn't out there because what the literature tells us is that only 23% of employees who feel like they've been harassed feel comfortable enough to report it. So it's still a topic for uh, us to explore and look at all the areas that uh, affect this topic. So looking a little bit at the history of where we've come, for sexual harassment in the workplace. At first, in 1964, it was covered under the Civil Rights Act. And then in 1980, the EEOC put it in place uh, as a prohibited act. And as we've moved forward, state codes and statutes and then BOLI have supported that. And in point of fact, uh, it's the law. And how we've seen this kind of evolve is that as people have felt comfortable coming forward, then it was tested in the courts and there were rulings uh, in favor of employees and financial um, damages paid. So for a period of time, when I think back, probably 90s and in the first decade of 2000, we hear a lot about sexual harassment cases coming into the workplace and what we call whistleblowers. Uh, and that actually, as we'll see in a minute or two, has um, slowed down just a little bit. So why should we care about this topic? Um, we've already said that it's protected by law and against the law. And over a period of time, as our awareness grew, there were more complaints. So 1991, there were 6,900 sexual harassment charges filed with the EEOC. And then in the year 2008, we had more than 75,000 total harassment complaints. And 12,500 charges were filed with the EEOC. And considering that we've had 75,000 total harassment, we can see it's not just about sex anymore. There are lots of complaints around age, gender, sexual orientation. And those of you in HR and supervise others probably know a lot better than, than I do just how many issues come forward uh, in addition to sexual harassment. So when we look a little bit further, although there are more charges being filed by males, where we didn't used to see any charges at all filed by males, now a little over 15% are, but actually there, um, the numbers have actually uh, have, have reduced. So um, although this slide says that 12,500 12, were received, there really have been less than that. So the figures have stagnated from 2008 to um, the later years. And lots of speculation about why that might be. It may be that the awareness that we've brought to workplaces have strengthened policies and then impacted um, the number of cases that come forward. And then in point of fact, what we're also kind of learning in research is that there are people that really still aren't comfortable at all coming forward. 
the statistics tell us that one in four to one in five employees feel like they have experienced sexual harassment, but as we've said before, only 21-23% of those are feeling comfortable bringing it forward. So we'll talk more about why that could be, but the paths to reporting are not always that easy to navigate. So all the more important to be raising these issues and talking about uh, sexual harassment in the workplace. So now to come down to some definitions. What are really the legal definitions of sexual harassment? Unsolicited and unwelcome verbal comments, then the nonverbal areas, which will include displays of uh, sexual pictures, gestures, or physical conduct of a sexual nature. It's a broad definition of sexual harassment. Sexual harassment includes unwelcome sexual advances, any suggestive behavior, work based on gender, and displays of sexual material that can be perceived as uh, disrespectful or a level of harassment by others uh, seen in the workplace. Then we start to define it a little more specifically. And the first, what we call type of sexual harassment, is quid pro quo. Um, not necessarily that easy to say, but the definition really is an exchange. It's something for something. For an example, you know, go out with me if you want that raise. Another way of looking at this is sexual blackmail. So again, it's I'll give you this uh, if, if you give me that is quid pro quo. Another type of sexual harassment is what we call hostile environment. So we talked initially about how the workplace is to feel safe for folks to come in every day and not anticipate that they're going to feel uncomfortable or that their work will be interfered with. But in point of fact, one type of sexual harassment is a hostile environment. And it really is another reason why we should care so much about this topic, because it can interfere with one's job and feel like an uncomfortable place to be. And this is important, certainly, from the employer's point of view so that you know that that impacts employees, and then also for the, for the employee in terms of how they feel about their workplace. Sexual, sexual favoritism is less explicit than quid pro quo, but still has to do with being granted uh, promotion or better assignments or other things that might be favorable as a result of submitting to what might be an unwelcome request for sexual favors. Both males and females can allege sexual harassment by showing they were denied a chance for a promotion because sexual favoritism was directed towards another employee. So for example, if I'm in the workplace and I perceive that my coworker is getting promotions faster than I do, or gets better assignments, and my perception is that's because there's some sexual favoritism going on with the supervisor and that employee, I can allege sexual harassment. So that's what we call sexual favoritism. Another type of sexual harassment is retaliation. So, and this is kind of what that whole um, topic of the whistleblower who blows the whistle and then gets punished for doing so is retaliated against. And what that can look like is being excluded from activities, uh, being denied a promotion, or getting more discipline that really is unwarranted as a result of having objected 
filed a claim themselves or assisted in an investigation. So it feels as if there's punishment uh, as a result of um, not going along with, with sexual harassment or invitations or in fact even bringing it forward. And this also kind of has to do with what a workplace culture looks like and how employees feel like the culture allows for sexual harassment or supports employees as they bring it forward. So retaliation, again, can include expressions of hostility, being treated disrespectfully, um, excessive monitoring, so being watched to um, to try to find when things are going wrong or when mistakes are made, or being assigned to demeaning tasks, discrediting. So it really can be uh, a punitive kind of reaction to bringing forward these topics. So here comes our second polling question, and I want to ask, uh, for you all to share if you've ever worked anywhere where sexual harassment was an issue. You know, I think, you know, I think of probably the most blatant example of sexual harassment in the workplace would be if anybody has watched Mad Men and we can see what that workplace looked like in probably starting in the 60s and then moving forward. Uh, and not that most workplaces are like that or were, but for me, who was in the workplace in the 70s and the 80s, I can say firsthand that what a workplace culture accepted in terms of this kind of behavior was far more permissive um, than it is now, and that even what we would question as sexual harassment uh, wasn't allowed. So this really has to do with workplace culture, what's acceptable, and I think for many years uh, workers didn't even question or think that maybe I'm treated disrespectfully or felt like they would be supported at all if they were to raise, to raise the issue. So 76 percent of you have voted, so if you would um, continue to put your vote in, uh, it's important for us to be able to take a look at, at your experience. So just so you know, so far 94% um, of you have voted and 63% say that you have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace, and 36 say that you haven't. So, and if you count me, I'm uh, in the yes category. So, um, interesting, so how we're scoring, we're above the one in four, one in five, <laughs> so we're overrepresented, I guess. Um, but it's interesting to see that, in, that we all have, um, have experienced this. Um, in our time in the workplace. Getting better, but we still uh, definitely got, got a long way to go. So we're going to move forward now. Thank you for doing that. So now we're going to kind of drill down to what some examples are. So first we look at verbal sexual harassment patronizing or sexual comments, being called honey or cutie or stud. And then I learned recently that another one for you know harassing to males would be called uh, dick, um, would be another uh, example of something that would be patronizing or sexually harassing. Uh, vulgar language, where there was swearing or language that's disrespectful. And remember that when we look and talk about sexual harassment, it really is in the eyes and ears of the beholder. So 
it might, you, you know, you, all of us, if we looked at all 60 or 59 of us, might uh, consider or interpret things differently. But the point is, is that if somebody's feeling like it's disrespectful and they hear or oversee it, uh, it, it, it can be a problem uh, in the workplace. Invasive personal questions can be considered harassing or remarks about sexual preference, spreading rumors, um, you know, kind of gossiping going to another level, jokes or stories that um, can be, um, feel like disrespectful or requiring personal favors. So we could probably uh, spend a lot of time sharing our own experiences, but I will say that I worked somewhere where um, I was first asked to pick up the cleaning of the owner and my boss of a company. And since it was down the street, um, I went ahead and did that. And then uh, within the next couple of weeks, I was asked to purchase um, some medication for the boss and deliver it to their home. And at that point, I said, <laughs> that's the limit. Um, but certainly, and this was in the late 70s, but requiring personal favors uh, was something that occurred in workplaces. So this is another form of sexual harassment that we've seen. Nonverbal sexual harassment, sexual looks or behaviors, uh, you know, glaring or leering or stalking, um, posters, pictures, or drawing that somebody's going to consider to be disrespectful. And with our computers, you know, we can have our first uh, screen be offensive to someone if there aren't some rules and boundaries around that. Facial or sexual gestures, uh, pursuing unwanted dates, not taking no for an answer, and uh, continuing to go down that path. Email, of course, you know, can be a breeding ground for uh, harassing behavior um, where messages are sent continuously and um, can be unwanted or unwelcome. So these are nonverbal sexual harassment categories. And then what we think of, the most, you know, probably blatant, standing too close to someone, brushing against a person, unwanted touching or touching oneself sexually. And then, you know, the greatest extreme of this would be a sexual act or even forcing themselves on someone or even rape would be considered certainly um, a form of sexual harassment. So these are more um, defined kind of definition. And you know, we look at some of these things and look at standing too close and, and uh, gesturing with just touching someone on the shoulder or whatever, but we need to kind of consider what people's boundaries are and what their cultural experiences are. And they might find them, uh, they might find those behaviors sexually harassing. So this is a, uh, a large area of concern when what your industry or workplace does is do a fair amount of interaction with contractors or people that are coming into the workplace. So harassment by non-employees is still illegal. Unwelcome sexual conduct directed towards employees by clients or customers. So I got curious about what industries had the highest degree of sexual harassment. And it's really quite interesting uh, that the hospitality industry, as one might expect, uh, is really a breeding ground for uh, disrespectful behavior because the customer is so closely involved with the employee in that situation. And as the employee, whether you're serving somebody in a restaurant or um, even in retail, uh, you're actually wanting to please that person as part of your job. And so it can open doors to 
some sexually harassing behavior. So when we, when we look at what industries have the highest level, we see hospitality, we see uh, retail, we see manufacturing, government, transportation, and this is in the order, really, of, of percentage. Uh, the professional industries, lawyers, doctors, education comes next, the construction industry, and maybe that's because it's generally singularly one gender, um, and then high tech, and I'm not quite sure why that is, unless people are just so busy um, in front of their computer. Uh, but it's interesting to look at where are the greatest uh, likelihoods of that happening. But know that legally, employers can be held liable for their sexual harassment of employees by customers or other third parties if they have some degree of control to stop the improper behavior. This kind of comes into the, you know, should they have known and um, what could they have done about it? And then, again, are employees feeling comfortable bringing those issues to management if they feel like it's been uh, their experience? So just a little more in terms of variety of circumstances, that the victim as well as the harasser may be a woman or a man. The victim doesn't have to be of the opposite sex. The harasser can be the supervisor, an agent of the employer, in other words, a contractor, a supervisor in another area, a coworker, or a non-employee. And by the way, Statistically, what literature tells us is that although there's a greater degree of uh, supervisor employee percentage, there's, there are a number of um, cases where it's been coworker to coworker in addition to that. The victim doesn't have to be the person that was harassed, but could be anyone affected by the offensive conduct. In other words, the person that witnesses may interpret it as um, abusive or harassing. And an unlawful sexual harassment may occur without an economic injury. In other words, I might not be um, kept from a promotion or fired, but it still can be sexual harassment. And the, uh, and the last one, that the harasser's conduct must be unwelcome, it must be unwelcome to someone. So in other words, if I absorb, observe it and it's feeling unwelcome to me or harassing, then that's good enough to be considered sexual harassment. So how do we prevent it? Certainly um, raising the question and uh, raising our own awareness that happens as a, as a consequence. Sometimes I think that maybe the pendulum has swung in other directions and have been in workplaces where people feel like they're not sure what's acceptable. Uh, how can they behave? Can they even give a compliment to a coworker? Uh, how can they um, feel like they're not offending someone? So uh, it's become a little trickier and a little harder area to navigate. But I think knowing who we're dealing with and other than a tested relationship where we know what our boundaries are generally to avoid personal questions and avoid you know gesture touching avoiding sexual remarks not displaying sexual material not telling sexual jokes not discussing gender certainly not requiring personal errands or assigning uh, social events. So in other words, some workplaces have a culture around um, parties and organizational event, uh, events and to not have employees feel pressured uh, to attend is another way of preventing sexual harassment. So moving forward, more tips uh, for avoiding uh, misunderstanding. 
be professional at all times, set a positive example. You know, kind of part of this is kind of like social intelligence, is kind of being aware of others' behavior and thinking before acting or making personal comments. Avoid making assumptions. Fortunately, our workplaces are becoming richer with different uh, cultures and different uh, orientations and really avoiding judgment and making assumptions about others is important to keep in mind. Not going along with the crowd. So folks making comments or uh, saying something, don't necessarily go along with that if you feel like that might be disrespectful uh, to someone. And this last one, you know, is practice the what if they were here. So the what if they were here could be your partner. It could be your brother, your sister, um, a child, your mother. Who, how, what is your highest level of kind of principle for uh, behavior? Another way to look at it is would you do a certain behavior or make a statement if that was going to be uh, the headline uh, on the paper the next day or uh, exposed through social media. So it's an awareness of behavior and how others might react to it. And above all, remain professional. Use sound judgment. Always convey dignity and respect to others. And knowing what your sexual harassment policy is. And if you're not aware of what that is, ask HR for a copy. But really knowing where your organization sits uh, on this topic uh, is very important. I'm hoping that if, you've ha if you have any questions as we go along, because there's plenty of places here where I would be asking if you have any questions, please let me know. I hope that you're... Um, putting some comments in the chat box to give us an opportunity to respond to any question you may have. So if you're sexually harassed, so what, what can we do? What are our options? And this requires uh, a comfort level. This really does kind of fall within, we say, promptly ask the individual to, to stop. If it's, if it's comfortable for you to do that, that's the first line of defense, letting that person know. Sometimes people are absolutely blind to their own behavior and how it can be interpreted. So giving the feedback and asking that person to stop and explaining that it, the, the behavior is offensive can be the first way uh, to look at this. And then reviewing um, the policy can uh, be helpful to you to know what your options are and know where, um, where you can go with this once this happens and who to go to. So now we're going to ask um, this last polling question. And if you've perceived that you were sexually harassed, have you felt comfortable bringing the issue forward to management? So sexual harassment is really about a, pi a power hierarchy. It really is about who has the power and who feels like they've got more to lose by bringing something forward. What do I have to gain and what do I have to, at risk uh, if I feel like I've been sexually harassed? there is still certainly a lot of fear around this area and a stigma by employees in feeling a comfort level um, to report it. And as I kind of said in the very beginning, that this path can be hard to navigate for a variety of reasons. It's interesting that a number of people that feel like they've been sexually harassed didn't know that their workplace had a policy around it or didn't know how to use it. Um, there have been times where people have 
uh, reported to human resources or their supervisor and have it felt as if they were taken seriously. So it takes, uh, it takes a risk, it takes courage to bring this forward. People can feel like it may not be worth their time, effort, and in, then in the event that they move forward and are not feeling satisfaction and have to go the legal way, it's costly. Um, and that can be a very difficult situation. So there's lots of reasons why people are, uh, can be reluctant. So 71% of you have voted, so we're going to wait um, just a couple more minutes to give the rest of you a chance to vote. Um, so far, 50% are saying that you have felt comfortable. Actually, now it's 54 and 46 have said that you haven't felt comfortable. But we're going to wait just a couple of minutes. And this really has to do with kind of what the message one gets um, about their workplace and what that culture looks like. So hopefully we haven't lost any listeners and um, that you'll take just a second to put your vote in. All right, so it's been just about three minutes and um, we've got close to 90%. So. 52% have said that you are comfortable, and 48 said that you that you have not been. So um, again, we're overrepresented, but in this this way, in a good way, that more than half of you have felt comfortable in uh, bringing this forward if you felt like you were um, sexually harassed. So that's that's good news. So let's keep going. So if you had felt like you were sexually harassed, some guidelines. Trust your instincts. Don't second guess yourself. Don't blame yourself. Document, document, document. You, a written record will be your most valuable uh, resource and tool. Your employer will need to know the who, what, where, when, and how often. Um, so to keep a record and log of this will be will be very will be very helpful. Pursuing the matter and using company channels and really trying to um, push through any fear that you may have can be really helpful. And if your harasser is your supervisor, then go either to HR or even further uh, up the chain until you feel like you've. Um, has satisfaction for your situation. Follow your policy uh, if your initial efforts fail. Review your policy and see what the company is telling and standing behind uh, on this topic and reporting to your supervisor. Now looking at the employer's role. So more than half of you listening are employers and manage, uh, manage others. Making sure your policy is clear, up to date, being a role model for behavior. Training staff, again, uh, raising the question is a good idea. It just raises the um, consciousness of this area. Take all charges seriously and investigate promptly. Assure confidentiality so that the person that's bringing it forward is not fearing retaliation. And we say provide equal opportunity. In other words, treat all um, charges equally and consistently can, can be the most helpful way to move forward as an employer. 
So interview all parties. Be objective. Manage your own reactions. Listen attentively and convey understanding to the person that's bringing this to you. Understand that this probably took some, um, some risk on that person's part. And be very objective about the interview and ask the who, what, when, and where um, to get a greater idea of what, uh, of what occurred. And give also some ideas to the person making the allegation of what will come next in terms of a course of action. So from a manager's point of view, understand that the biggest mistake has been failing to take every complaint seriously. And when we get to determining liability, the questions that are asked is, did the employer actually know or should have known harassment was taking place? The should have is, I think, what the, what the legal term is, what the average person would have uh, perceived in that situation is the should have known. And then, once it was brought to the employer's attention, did they make a good faith effort to stop the harassment? These are kind of the guideposts in terms of uh, being held liable if um, these kinds of issues are brought, are brought forward. So consequences can be extremely costly uh, to employers. It's extremely costly to the employee that's bringing it forward. But employers have uh, had to dip into lots of money for even the lawsuit costs, let alone uh, the financial remuneration. It's uh, distracting. It takes time. It takes energy from the management and also from the employee. Probably equally important is that it reduces goodwill, image, and reputation within the workplace. So if we're not feeling comfortable or if the uh, organization has a reputation for not taking these things seriously, it can increase absence and it can increase uh, turnover. So consequences for not taking these things seriously not training on the subjects, and then not responding um, can be hard felt for employers. So it's a very important thing to keep at the forefront. And I know that we've worked, RBH has worked with a number of, of employers that actually train on this topic once a year or once every couple of years just to uh, keep this topic in the forefront. So at this point, We've uh, completed the, the program uh, on its own. And have there been any questions that have come forward? No. OK. So if you have any questions now, we'll give you a couple of minutes to put them in the chat box. Or you could forward any question that you might have to Russ uh, Walker, and he could He'll forward them to me. Yep. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Karen. I appreciate it. This is our, our first webinar. Uh, and I, and I think the information was very valuable. And I look forward to the the rest of the webinars we have. And I believe uh, Karen is actually doing another one I later am. on. Yeah. Okay. And in, in addition to you know quite a few speakers lined up for the next 12 months. Uh, so if you have any other questions, feel free to get uh, you know send my email. I think my email is on the invitation that you got. Uh, it's russw at reliantbh.com. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. And we hope you have a, a fantastic day. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. One question. Oh, it did? <laughs>